massive air parades of the 30s. Different types of combat aircraft fly in the sky. From one parade to another, demonstration becomes more immense. Bombers become bigger and bigger. Here is a passenger giant Maxim Gorky, which if needed may become a bomber. With this kind of power, any enemy can be defeated. Such groove of power fitted well ambitions of the young state. Aviation parades become the sign of the grandeur and might of the country. It did not take long for the big war to test the endurance of this might. Bombers. The Air Armada. The National Bombers Aviation History counts itself from December 10, 1914, when Tsar Nicholas II signed an order on reorganization of the Army Aviation. Since this point, it was divided into heavy and light aviation. Bombers represented the heavy aviation. This aviation division was identified as the Air Fleet Squad. The squad appeared thanks to two people, Igor Sikorsky and Mikhail Shidlovsky. A year and a half prior to the order, a twin-engine Grand aircraft took off from an airfield near St. Petersburg. It was built at the Russian Baltic plant. The big biplane was piloted by the designer himself, Igor Sikorsky. No other country in the world at that time ever built an aircraft with more than one engine. This one had two, and it was a transition version. Later on, Sikorsky put two more engines on the aircraft. Now it was called the Russian Knight. This aircraft was not yet a bomber, but while designing it, Sikorsky was already thinking of the flying giants having military application. You've gone so far, Igor. 400 horsepower. A hero. A hero? Good thought. I will call it Ilya Muromets. Ilya Muromets, designed by Sikorsky, was gigantic for those times. The upper wing spread was 32 meters. It could carry up to 800 kilograms of bombs of different calibers. It had a crew of four people. The first Muromets took off from an aerodrome in St. Petersburg in December 1913. And again, it was piloted by the designer himself. Flight tests confirmed Sikorsky's calculations. He created a new powerful weapon, the world's first heavy bomber. The Muromets commissioned to the Russian army were first used discreetly. However, combat activities showed that this was inefficient. Then the chairman of the board of the Russian Baltic plant, Mikhail Shidlovsky, came up with an idea of combining bombers into a single force. In 1914, he was appointed to command the squad, the first in history heavy aircraft unit. The squad of 10 aircraft started its front activities in February 1915. The first Muromets combat flight was performed by a crew of Captain Gershko. The 500 km flight range allowed to perform raids into the enemy's deep air. At first it was enough for the crew to have a couple of machine guns and several rifles for the aircraft's protection in the air. But with the appearance of the enemy's fighters, the Muromets armament had to be reinforced. The following modifications constantly had more machine guns. One of the latest versions had already eight firing positions. An option of equipping the aircraft with a minor cannon was under consideration. By 1916, lagging behind the entire world in fighters, Russia had an undisputed priority in heavy bombers. By that time, the squad contained over 30 Muromets aircraft. Besides, there were escort fighters, reconnaissance aircraft, support and training airplanes. Plans existed on further quantitative and qualitative development of the squad. But there came 1917. In the chaos after the October Revolution, nobody at first even thought about aviation. Only with the start of the Civil War, 
there was a try to collect what survived. Among other things, the Red Army got several Murmits, which by analog with the Tsarist squad, were turned into an air fleet division. By the end of the Civil War, the Red Army commanders started to think of the post-war development of the armed forces, including aviation. The situation was unpromising, aircraft were outdated and worn out, industry was in decline. Qualified pilots and technical staff were hard to be found. While the task of strategic impact of the potential enemy's deep rear was actual as never before. Since for the Soviet Russia, almost all neighbors were indeed the potential enemies. The Heavy Aviation Committee was established in spring 1920. It was headed by Professor Nikolai Yegorovich Zhukovsky. The document adopted at the first meeting of this committee said, Existence of the heavy aviation together with the light one is necessary since the bomb dropping task cannot be carried out by the light aviation. This committee developed a twin engine triplane Comta, which was absolutely unsuccessful. Several other heavy bomber projects were rejected. It was then decided to purchase aircraft abroad. After the First World War, there were enormous reserves of combat aircraft, which nobody needed. And it was easy to buy everything at a relatively low price. In autumn 1925 in Moscow, before the arrival of the aircraft, the Heavy Aviation Unit was established. Half a year later, it received Goliath aircraft purchased in France. Those were big twin-engine wooden biplanes. They did not have any combat significance, but they were the ones that started the restoration of the bombing aviation. The first real heavy bombers in the Russian Air Force were the three-engine German UG-1 aircraft of Junkers company. They started to arrive in Russia in February 1927, amounting to 22 aircraft. Part of them went to the Navy, while the rest formed two air squads. Soon the Soviet Union succeeded in building bombers of its own. In summer 1930, the first national TB-1 aircraft took part in maneuvers of the Leningrad military district. TB-1 was designed and built in Russia and its name was deciphered as Heavy Bomber 1. This aircraft was made in Tsagi under the supervision of Andrei Tupolev. TB-1 was way more advanced with higher speed and bomb load than Junker. What was important, from the start it was built as a combat aircraft, while the German aircraft represented a refurbishment of a passenger airplane. TB-1 laid the foundation of the powerful heavy bomber aviation of the USSR. It amounted to 200 aircraft. Such amount allowed not only to withdraw outdated Goliath and Junkers, but to start forming almost a dozen of air squadrons. New bombers were much appreciated by the pilots. They received the world best aircraft of this class. It was decided to show the Soviet aviation achievement to the whole world. In autumn 1929, the crew of Simon Shostakov flew TB-1 named the Soviet state from Moscow to New York through the Far East and Alaska. It enjoyed warm reception in America. TB-1 obtained more popularity after the salvation of the Chelyuskin expedition. It was on this aircraft that Anatoly Lepidevsky first found and rescued the suffering explorer. TB-1 were the most powerful machines of the Air Force of that time. They were proudly shown at air parades. Fifty and more bombers would fly over the Red Square. Until 1934, TB-1 made the basis of the heavy aviation. In the beginning of the 30s, the Soviet leadership set a goal to create a powerful strategic aviation. 
This term first appeared in 1931 when a number of documents on the Soviet Air Force development were adopted. According to such documents, the twin-engine TB-1 was already a frontline aircraft. A more heavy aircraft was supposed to make the basis for the strategic aviation. This place was occupied by the four-engine TB-3. With a takeoff weight of 18 tons, its range amounted to almost 1,500 kilometers. TB-3 aircraft is the first Soviet multi-engine heavy bomber of a solid metal layout. Bombs from 250 to 1,000 kilograms are suspended under the fuselage, while bombs from 50 to 100 kilograms are placed in the bomb sections along the fuselage. Upon an order of Kremlin, the first 10 aircraft were supposed to fly in the Moscow sky on May 1, 1932. But the engines assembled in a hurry did not work properly. Controls malfunctioned and there was no ammunition. However, the corrugated giants took part in the parade. Engineers were sitting inside the wings with cans of water ready to fill in the leaking cooling system. The effect was reached. Foreigners were astonished by the formation of the giant aircraft. No other country in the world had anything like that. Three tons of bombs, eight machine guns, 11 crew members. There comes the second wave of bombers. They will now finish destroying the target started by the first group. The aiming is precise. The dummy facility has been destroyed. The picturesque split and polish quickly turned into real combat power. By 1933, there were already 144 TB-3 aircraft in the Soviet Air Force. These aircraft were the flagships of the Air Force piloted only by the best Soviet pilots. Aircraft commanders were selected most diligently. They had to comply with the flight hours rate, qualification standard and years of the party membership. The latter was hard to comply with, since pilots were too young and half a year later this requirement was dropped. Massive heavy bombers commissioning allowed to start formation of the long-range aviation brigade. One heavy bomber's brigade consisted of 40 B-3 squadrons with 12 aircraft in each. This kind of might could drop up to 150 tons of bombs on the enemy in one flight. The brigade also included escort aircraft and fighters to protect the base airdrome. The tasks posted before the heavy aviation involved destruction of large military and industrial facilities, ports, airdromes, as well as fulfillment of special political tasks. The world revolution concept was still alive and the bombers were to support rebellion and assist partisan units. The TB-3 range was such that from the airdromes of Belarusia and Ukraine they could cover the entire Eastern Europe while in the Far East they could dominate most territories of Japan and Korea. A mobile strategic fist could be concentrated at any frontier at very short notice. At the Japanese military assessment, three brigades concentrated in the Far East were capable of burning down the wooden paper Tokyo in just one raid. Note that in mid-30s neither the West nor the East had any heavy bomber aviation. Japanese had only five aircraft of this class. There were twin-engine Martin B-10 aircraft in the U.S. military aviation, but they referred to middle-class bombers while the heavy bomber prototype was only entering tests. It was a prototype of an aircraft subsequently known as B-17, the Flying Fortress. The British Air Force had around 100 outdated twin-engine Heifert biplanes. France had a small amount of heavy bombers, while Germany had none of this kind of aircraft. 
hundreds of the Soviet Red Army TV-3s represented a mighty power and a strong argument in the foreign policy. And this might was demonstrated regularly. Besides air parades, the bombers were shown all around Europe and everywhere they aroused enormous interest. Meanwhile, in the military plans, TB3 was deemed only an intermediate state. It was supposed to be substituted by far larger bomber. In July 1933, Mikhail Gromov took a six-engine TB4 aircraft into the sky. This machine could carry 10 tons of bombs. A seven-engine K7 aircraft built in Kharkov by a team of Konstantin Kalinin could take on board up to 14 tons of combat payload. The scale went on. Tupolev worked on a 12-engine TB-6 aircraft capable of carrying 25 tons of bombs. The wingspan of this giant amounted to 95 meters. The military mines were drawing plans for even more larger aircraft capable of carrying the deadly load anywhere, whether it's Malta or Suez Canal. But plans are best on paper. In reality, there were not enough industrial potential, no suitable motors, no equipment or ammunition. Calculated operation costs of such giants were astonishing. Amounts were astronomical. Huge bomb carriers required adequate aerodromes, hangars and special equipment. The heavy bombers fleet would consume a sea full of fuel and oil. Gigantomania led to nowhere. The works on super bomb carriers started to wrap up. However, TB3 production continued. The aircraft was constantly modified. Now there were new engines of a more powerful Mikulin's design. Protecting armament was reinforced. The combat load was significantly increased, including both bombs and chemical weapons. Several aircraft were equipped to fly in high latitudes. They had a covered cockpit and an improved navigation equipment. On May 21, 1937, Mikhail Vodopyanov landed such an aircraft in the vicinity to the North Pole. He delivered a scientific expedition headed by Papanin. Factories manufactured over 800 TB-3 aircraft. Such amount allowed strategic aviation organization to arrive at a new quality stage. The existing brigades were combined into aviation corps while in January 1936 the first special purpose army was created in the Moscow region. There were three of them all in all, two in the European part and one in the Far East. Each army amounted to around 250 aircraft including 160 heavy bombers. No other country in the world at that time could afford itself this kind of might. By the end of the 30s, TB3 began to outdate. Corrugated skin, non-retractable landing gears, open cabins, all this limited its flight range and in general was deemed anachronism. In 1931, Tupolev proposed an alternative to its own heavy bomber. Everything in the layout of the new aircraft was supposed to help reaching the maximum range. This was to be done at the expense of speed, protective armament power and even bomb load. The aircraft, however, could fly deep into the enemy's rear and perform an unexpected strike over almost unreachable targets. This aircraft was the record-breaking ANT-25 on which later on the crews of Gromov and Chkalov performed direct flights over the North Pole to America. In the morning of July 18, the Soviet Sagi-25 aircraft would assign the Stalin's route on its fuselage started on a long Arctic route from Moscow through North Pole to America. The brave trio, Chkalov, Baidukov and Belikov, went across the Arctic Ocean. 
Taking off from an airdrome near Moscow, they overcame the thick fogs of the North Pole, flew over Canada, and after 63 hours and 25 minutes of flight, having covered 8,504 kilometers, they landed at a military airdrome in Portland, Oregon. In 1932, with the support of the Air Force, Tupolev started development of a super-long-range bomber with a combat radius of 3,500 kilometers and a bomb load of half a ton. The ANT-25 military version was identified as DB-1, the first long-range bomber. Air Force management was going to order 50 aircraft of this kind, but in reality, after many delays, just a small batch was produced. DB-2 became a successor of DB-1, representing in fact the ANT-25 airframe upgraded for two engines. The goal was to increase the aircraft's speed and bomb load with the preservation of the range. The aircraft entered tests in summer 1935. In spite of the accident with the first machine, there came an order to get DB-2 ready for serial production. But this aircraft had competitors. At the May 1, 1935 parade, the Lucian CKB-26 prototype bomber flew over the Red Square. The same evening, the aircraft was shown to Stalin and other members of the government. Designers arranged the bomber aerobatic show, so unusual for this type of aircraft. Pilot Vladimir Kokinaki performed a cascade of bank turns, pull-ups, spirals, ending up with three loops. Nobody in this country ever made such things on a two-engine aircraft. Stalin asked of a favor to expedite the tests in order to have the aircraft in production by the end of summer. He did not have in mind the demonstrated CKB-26, but the improved all-metal CKB-30, which was already a real long-range bomber. It was a good challenge to get a fast aircraft with a range of 400 kilometers and a bomb load of 500 kilos. The aircraft rushed through the factory tests and then the state tests. With the latter still incomplete, the aircraft was commissioned under the name of DB-3. Starting from 1937, it was produced at three factories and by 1938, over 600 bombers were already at service in combat unit. As to DB-2, its tests were stopped. Its last flying copy was modernized and called the birthplace. In September 1938, the crew of Valentina Grisadubova set a women's world record having flown 5,947 kilometers without landing. DB-3 was involved in historic flights as well. On the aircraft Moscow designed by Illusion, hero of the Soviet Union Kokinaki laid down the new air route from the Soviet Union to the United States of America across the Atlantic. Besides propaganda, pure military tasks were pursued in these flights. Methods of aircraft quick relocation to faraway areas of this country. However, long-range machines with their relatively minor bomb load could not perform as heavy bombers. While the latter no more complied with the time requirements, a new aircraft was needed which could fly farther, faster and higher. In 1934, the design bureau of the Air Force Academy introduced a DBA aircraft, which was TB-3 further development with plain skin and a semi-retractable landing gear. This aircraft was created under the guidance of Viktor Balkhavitino. The first DBA prototype took off in May 1935. However, tests revealed so many defects that production plan for the next year was stopped. The last drop in the Balkhavitino's aircraft destiny was failure of Sigismund Levanevsky's flight in August 1937. The crew left Moscow planning to reach United States through the North Pole, but vanished in the Arctic, leaving no trace. 
construction of four other previously started aircraft were completed by 1938 and that where the DBA works were terminated. At the same time, TB-7 bomber was being built in the Tupolev Design Bureau under the supervision of Vladimir Petlikov, which later was identified as PE-8. On December 27, 1936, the prototype aircraft made its first flight. It was a great step forward as compared with TB-3. With the same bomb load, the aircraft could fly three times longer. During tests, a speed of 430 kilometers per hour was reached at an altitude of 8,600 meters. For the first time, a heavy bomber surpassed a fighter speed at a high altitude. The fifth engine installed in the fuselage bringing air to the other four provided for the high altitude of the bomber. Later on, after equipping the aircraft with more sophisticated engines, the fifth engine idea was dropped. However, improvement and mastering of the aircraft production took a long time. It was when Tupolev and Petlikov were arrested as enemies of the nation and the works were frozen. The first aircraft entered the Air Force only in 1940. Thus, in the end of the 30s, the USSR strategic aviation consisted of several hundreds of outdated heavy TB-3 bombers and over a thousand of the long-range TB-3. TB-3 first combat actions participation was at the Hassan Lake in summer 1938. In the end of July, the Japanese forces crossed the Soviet border. The Red Army ground forces aimed at throwing the enemy out were supported by a powerful air unit of 250 aircraft, including 60 TB-3. In the morning of August 6, all the smite was thrown against the enemy's trenches, artillery and rear units. Above all, the action had a huge psychological effect. In less than a year, Japanese occupied a piece of Mongolian territory near the river Halkingol. The Soviet Union, in accordance with a treaty, came to help Mongolia. Two squadrons of four-engine giants took part in supporting ground forces. But the war with Finland in 1939-1940 became a more serious test. Bombers had a lot of work to do. Combat actions took place in severe frosts of minus 40 Celsius. It took from five to six hours to heat up aircraft. Hydro mixture freezed in flight. Thickened lubricant blocked machine guns and bomb release mechanisms. There were no heated cabins. Crews worked in fur overalls and boots, while TB-3 pilots had no roof overhead. No wonder that the first combat flights involved a lot of losses. The Finns did not have a lot of fighters, but they were concentrated on hunting bombers. The Soviet aircraft in this respect were vulnerable since they often went beyond the accompanying fighters' range. The war with Finland gave the Red Army invaluable experience. It revealed drawbacks of the Soviet bombers. Works started to upgrade DB-3. They were equipped with more powerful engines, tank explosion suspension system, and reinforced armor. By that time, production of a new modification DB-3F was started, differing by its spindle-type nose. This aircraft was soon identified as Illusion 4 by the name of its designer. Despite expectations, this aircraft failed to provide improved flight characteristics. Moreover, in speed and range, it was inferior than the base modification. Piloting became more complicated, therefore the aircraft was considered to be temporary until the production of the new DB-4 and DB-240 bombers. The plan was to have over two dozens of air regiments equipped with these aircraft in 1941. DB-4, however, was so unlucky that nobody wanted to take the risk of even putting it on state tests. DB-240 had a different story. It represented the Stahl 7 passenger aircraft designed by Roberto Bartini, a political immigrant from Italy, refurbished into a long-range bomber. 
However, Bartini was named people's enemy and the designer's team was headed by his deputy Vladimir Yermolaev. The latter succeeded in making an aircraft with significantly better characteristics than of DB-3. It has much larger bomb load and range than the Illusion aircraft. DB-240 was produced as ER-2. By mid-40s, the leadership of the Soviet Union realized that war was inevitable. However, Stalin still hoped to defer the war, winning time to rearm and reorganize the army. Better than anyone else, he knew that neither thousands of DB-3 nor TB-3 complied with the requirements of the time. Several copies of the new aircraft could not change the situation. The foreign political situation changed a lot. At numerous maneuvers, the Red Army mostly drilled offensive operations, while now it needed more to get ready for defense. In such a situation, fighters were of greater demand rather than bombers. But time was lost. On June 22, 1941, the German troops crossed the USSR border and started to advance deep into its territory. Massive bombing of the borderline regions preceded the invasion. Invaders had practically no long-range bombers and this saved the Soviet aviation from bigger losses. The German command pursued the strategy of fast advance into the enemy's territory with the support of the frontline aviation. Most of the airdromes where the Soviet long-range bombers were based were located far from the border and escaped damage from the first blow. Already by midday June 22, aircraft took off on combat tasks. Raids were performed according to pre-war plans. Long-range aviation attacked targets in Germany and Poland, bombing Tilsit and Königsberg. Starting from June 23, bombers were sent to help frontline aviation. They attacked enemies close rear, bombing railroad joints, echelons, vehicles and tanks, headquarters and airdrome. Illusion bombers acted at daytime in relatively large groups of close formation and on high altitude. They delivered significant damage to the enemy but suffered a lot of losses too. Most of the losses were suffered from the German fighters. They quickly found the DB-3 most vulnerable point, attacking them from beneath behind. In an attempt to somehow slow down the enemy's advance, the long-range bombers were used as attack aircraft. Bombing was performed from an altitude of 400 meters without aiming, just at sight. Machine guns were used to fire at vehicles, minor caliber bombs were used against tanks, and often ampules with inflammable mixture were also at use. However, DB-3 was very vulnerable at low altitude not only to small caliber air defense artillery, but to machine guns as well. Amount of losses radically increased. In the beginning of war, the long-range bombers were used in their direct designation only to perform raids on Berlin. Of course, nobody thought of causing any serious damage to the German capital. Such operations were more of a political rather than military significance. Such raids were started by the Navy aviation, which also had a lot of DB-3. From August 11, crews of the 1st Bomber Air Corps joined the raids. The Ezil Island in the Baltic Sea was used as the base. One of the Berlin raids was performed by several new PE-8 and ER-2. They took off from an airdrome near Leningrad. Not all of them reached the target, even less returned back. Bombers suffered losses not only from the enemy, 
The secret outlook of those aircraft was not familiar to Soviet air defense and it opened fire. One of the PE-8 was attacked by Red Star E-16 fighter. In general, aviation operations in the beginning of war were poorly organized. Slow TB-3 were used at daytime, but due to lack of support fighters, heavy aircraft suffered huge damages, especially during bombings at low and medium altitudes. Look to your right. Look. Why don't they use parachutes? Maybe they don't have parachutes. Attempts were made to use TB-3 as fighter carriers. Such airborne aircraft carrier design works started in 1931 by engineer Vladimir Vachmistrov. At first, suspended aircraft were regarded as escort fighters, while in 1938 they were qualified into diving bombers. The TB-3 range allowed to carry fighters into the enemy's deep rear where they would independently carry out their combat task. After bombing, aircraft would return to their nearest aerodrome. This system was even adopted for service, however, due to its complexity, it was not widely used. Frontline activities caused a serious impact on the quantity of the bomber's fleet. Losses were partially compensated by relocating units from beyond the Ural. Many enterprises were evacuated to the east and aircraft factory deliveries were gradually reducing. Production of ER-2 stopped. DB-3 continued to be produced only at one factory. PE-8 was little by little assembled in Kazan, but soon a factory producing PE-2 was brought there from Moscow, which became the main product. TB-3 production was stopped long ago. Aircraft for the front were being assembled at air schools, transport units, and even at dumps restored from scratch. In order to preserve at least the nucleus of strategic aviation, in autumn 1941, two divisions were assigned directly to the Commander-in-Chief headquarters, while in March of next year, the long-range aviation was established headed by General Alexander Golovanov. Reorganization, however, did not influence much the application tactics. Until summer 1942, circumstances urged to use heavy and long-range bombers to fill in the gaps here and there, or to use them for specific state assignments. In 1942, a PEA bomber was used in one of those unusual long-distance flights. It was a very secret and important task. The crew of Endel Pusep delivered first to England and then to the USA a Soviet delegation headed by Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. Negotiations related to the opening of the Second Front. After the visit, the diplomatic mission returned to Moscow. The bomber traveled almost 18,000 kilometers passing territories occupied by the enemy. PS-84 aircraft were used as bombers in the operations of 1942. This machine was more known as Lee-2 and represented a copy of the American passenger Douglas DC-3 airliner. Since 1939, they were being built near Moscow, while since autumn 1941 in Tashkent. It was in Tashkent that the military transport version with a big cargo door and defense armament of four machine guns was started. Deficit of combat aircraft urged this aircraft refurbishment into a bomber. Upgrade was minimal, external bomb suspension and a primitive aiming device on the right board. The navigator had to look out of the window in order to take an aim.
During the war, aircraft designers were pressed by one main condition. Any change and improvements could be done only if the production rate is not reduced. Therefore, the same types of bombers remained in production. They were gradually modified by installing more advanced engines, enforced armament, improved armor, including some changes in the layout, but this did not bring any radical increase of combat capabilities. By the end of 1942, the long-range aviation received B-25 Mitchell American bomber delivered under Lend-Lease. With a deficit of our own aircraft, substantial deliveries of B-25 were just in time. The American aircraft in the USSR was compared with Il-4 and such comparison was not in favor of the latter. With B-25 being inferior in terms of maximum speed and service ceiling, the Soviet pilots noticed a whole number of advantages of the foreign machine. Comfort for the crew, voluminous bomb section, powerful defensive armament, excellent controls and radio equipment. The Aleutian bomber didn't have any heating or insulation. In the American aircraft, the crew worked at practically room temperature. The aircraft even had such a bourgeois luxury as a toilet bowel, which in flight served as a seat for the rifleman. The American bomber was way more stable and simpler in piloting. Besides, it was equipped with an automatic pilot device. Everyone who managed to fly on B-25 had most war memories of this aircraft. B-25 deliveries and increased IL-4 production allowed to significantly reinforce the long-range aviation. Aircraft were built on the money of common people. There was even a movement born in this country to collect money for the combat equipment production. One of such aircraft was piloted by a young pilot, Vladimir Petrov. His bomber carried a sign to pilot son from dad Yermolai Petrov. In autumn 1943, there started formation of eight new aviation units. There is going to be some work for the colonel's Jacobson's pilots. Let's get ready for the summer 1943 offensive. There will be work for the entire Soviet aviation. Long-range bombers took part in all the major campaigns of 1943. Over 700 aircraft were summoned for the Kursky Duga battle. PE-8 aircraft used the most powerful 5-ton air bombs during the Ariol belgorod combat operation. Long-range bombers assisted in breaking the Leningrad blockade. In the middle of the war, the main targets remained the railroad joints and airdromes in the enemy's close rear. But gradually, long-range bombers began to carry tasks of their direct designation. More and more, the long-range targets in Germany, Hungary, Romania were now chosen for bombing. Here is a unique documentary. The new members exchange impressions after the flight. This is not our first flight into the fascist rear. Königsberg, Denton, Berlin are the main targets and we have made a reliable route to those facilities. On our way, we saw fenced concentration camps. We wanted to help war prisoners, but did not have such a chance. 
The only thing we could do is to drop them leaflets as a message from our motherland. The Soviet aviation was not the only one that performed bombings of Germany and its allies. Masses of the British Stirling, Halifax and Lancaster bombers disturbed Germans day and night. Later, they were joined by numerous American B-17 flying fortresses and B-24 liberators. The raids of the British and Americans had their own specifics. Preferring to bomb military facilities, they also practiced bombing of the cities having no express military significance. Such missions served as a moral lesson, a revenge for the cities of England destroyed by the Germans. The most widely known and the most senseless from the military point of view was the bombing of the German Dresden in February 1945, when over 135,000 peaceful citizens were killed. It is worth mentioning that while in the mid-30s the Soviet Union was the leader in the sphere of heavy bomber aviation, in both quantity and quality, during the war the Allies significantly surpassed the USSR. The reason was in the principally different approach toward the combat activities conduct. Avoiding direct confrontation, USA and Great Britain preferred to destroy economic and military facilities of the Third Reich from the air. Bombers in this respect represented the decisive force. In 1944, in the Pacific Combat Activities, Americans used their new bomber B-29 Super Fortress. By the level of technology and equipment, this aircraft surpassed all aircraft of the same class. With a speed of 575 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 10,000 meters, this bomber was practically unreachable for the enemy's air defense. With a bomb load of four tons, its flight range exceeded 5,000 kilometers. The Allies built around 50,000 heavy bombers altogether. The Soviet long-range aviation could not be proud of the number of its heavy aircraft. However, its contribution to the victory was significant. Its bombers took part in every operation of the final war period. The closer to the end of the war, the more powerful the long-range aviation became. In December 1944, it was reorganized into the 18th Air Army and was made part of the Air Force. This army, with its almost 1,500 combat aircraft, represented a serious force. The most mass aircraft was Li-2, followed by Il-4. And the American B-25 on the third place. Over 600 long-range bombers were involved in the Berlin combat operation. During the war years, the crews of the Soviet long-range aviation performed 220,000 combat flights and dropped over 2 million tons of bombs over the enemy troops and facilities. Finishing the war with Germany, the Soviet army turned to the Far East to fight against Japan. Weakened by the war with the USA and practically unable to resist, Japanese found themselves under a powerful blow of the Soviet troops. For the USSR, the war against Japan lasted only 12 days. But the main full stop was put by the Americans. On August 6, 1945, the American B-29 Super Fortress, with the name of Enola Gay on its board, headed to Hiroshima. The bomber's crew dropped the first in history of mankind atomic bomb over this Japanese city. Three days after, the Americans repeated their action by destroying another Japanese city, Nagasaki. In 
It was the start of a principle in new history which main character will be the atomic weapon and the means of its delivery. Not yet finishing one war, mankind was entering a new one, the Cold War.